doing work as a, um, I started doing kind of social work. I, I, mm -hmm. I went to spend a couple of years uh, working at the hospital where I, they told me to become a chaplain. And uh, I started doing chaplaincy work. In, in the, I was for 13 years, I was the chaplain at the Jew, at the, a Jewish chaplain at the Toronto jail. Hey, you Pinkus, know? I'm going to interrupt you just to oh, let you yeah, know well, that we're going to let people in. We're going to start our theme that's music. Fine. Then let I'm, people I'm, in. That's right. I'm keeping quiet now. All right. <laughs> I'm actually going to mute myself. <laughs> you need to mute yourself. everyone and welcome to Veterans Breakfast Club for Wednesday, January 26th. This is a special event tonight that we are holding uh, in honor of what is the eve now of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. We're marking the 77th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, we have a, a special program lined up for you here. Uh, the, for those of you who have joined us before, you may know Scott Masters, who's led a couple of our programs prior uh, to tonight. Um, he's going to be uh, leading tonight. I'm going to hand it off to him in just a minute. Um, but our special guest is Pinkus Guter, uh, a Holocaust survivor himself from Poland. He was seven years old when the war began. And he, is, he and his family were captured in April of 1943. Um, I'm going to let him um, pretty much pick up from there. It's a very, uh, very interesting story and one that we all need to hear. And something Pinka said before we started tonight was that it's his duty to, to, to tell these stories. Um, uh, so we are grateful and honored, Pinkus, to have you join us tonight. Scott, uh, it's an honor, as always, also to have you here with us. And uh, uh, I'll let you take it away. Thanks very much for that, Sean. And thank you to you as well, Todd. And Pink, because it's really nice to see you in this forum. And I really appreciate your taking the time to, to join us tonight. I've been really lucky, everybody. I've known Pincus for a little more than 10 years now. He first came to my school around 2009, 2010 to meet with my students. And he's come back on many occasions since. And every time I meet him, you know, I hear something new in what he's talking about and his ability to explain what he lived through um, really is quite remarkable. So I approached Todd about this, I, I think a couple of months ago, um, asking if he would be interested in doing a show on this topic. And I was very pleased to, to see that was, he was willing to do so. Um, obviously, International Holocaust Remembrance Day is tomorrow. Many of you guys know I'm a school teacher. I happen to have parent teacher interviews tomorrow night. So we decided to, to do it tonight uh, instead. And Pincus has a very, very busy day tomorrow. So I think I think um, tonight probably works out better for, uh, for him as well. So I'll go into share screen here because I do have some images and so forth that I wanted to be able to show to you guys. Um, so obviously here we have Pincus and I'm willing to bet that he's somebody that a lot of you guys might know from somewhere else. So I actually wanted to begin um, with a very, very quick clip from 60 Minutes, because Pincus was on 60 Minutes a number of years ago about a very interesting way to present uh, Holocaust study. So we'll come back to that a little bit later, but for those of you who, who may remember that story, the Shoah Institute, which is a, an institute dedicated to preserving the memory of the Holocaust, it began with, uh, with Spielberg in LA all those years ago with, uh, with Schindler's List. They started recording the memories of Holocaust survivors and then created a hologram, hologram program rather uh, to keep that memory alive. And Pincus was actually the first survivor that the Shoah Foundation brought in um, to sit for that. And it's an absolutely fascinating way of learning about things. We're lucky to have him with us in person though. Um, this is a picture of Pincus in my classroom a number of years ago. I've brought him in on many occasions and the students sit there and they're absolutely focused uh, on every word he has to say. We sort of set the classroom up as a theater in the round whenever we have people uh, come to visit. And 
Pincus is going to talk about, you know, the incredible importance of this day, January 27th. As Sean said earlier, the day when the when the Red Army liberated Auschwitz. And as I indicated a few moments ago, tomorrow will be a very busy day for Pincus because amongst other things, he's got like four interviews at a minimum scheduled in Toronto. He's also part of the United Nations outreach program. So you'll be able to, to access that uh, tomorrow as well. I thought the best place to start our talk with Pincus tonight would be by showing a map of Poland. And I'll start talking with Pincus in a moment about uh, some of the powerful memories that he has, but certainly key locations to be aware of. Pincus is going to talk about his time in Warsaw and also in the city. It looks like Lodz, but it's pronounced Woods. Um, and Pincus, I wanted to begin by asking you to share some, some stories about your life before the war. We heard a little bit of it from the hologram a moment ago, but uh, what are some of the other memories you have of your young life in Poland? Well, you know, I was born into a very religious uh, family and uh, my immediate family uh, was very small. My enlarged family was very large. We had over, there were over 150 uh, people uh, in, in my kind of enlarged family um, and maybe more even uh, all over Poland. But um, my mother, I had a twin sister. My mother, unfortunately, couldn't have any more children after she gave birth to us. Obviously, it must have been a good reason for that, uh, which I don't know. I was a child and nobody told me. I, I, so I only had my twin sister. And I was a very happy child. Uh, you know, um, in, in, before the war, uh, regardless of the fact, and I can tell you, because taking into consideration what is going on at the moment, with, you know, nationalism, uh, populism, uh, um, and all kinds of other isms, you know, Islamophobia, antisemitism, and all these things are raising isolationism, and, and, and all these things are raising their ugly head. I think I must tell you that even that before the war, the Jewish community in Poland were all Polish citizens, just like everybody else. We they were Christian. Uh, Poles and they were Jewish Poles. As far as that is concerned, to this day, I regard myself as a Pole. I'm a Polish man. My birthright is Polish. Um, but just let me give you an idea. When I was about four, I'll tell you one story. One, when I was about four and a half years old, I had pneumonia. I was very, very ill. And uh, I still remember what actually happened. I, I've got a very good, you know, uh, memory. I've got actually a pictorial memory. I remember everything in, in, in picture. That the doctor that was treating me, and I remember his name was Dr. Herschwickel. I was either four and a half or five, something like that. It was the ages of, eight, of four and five. And uh, what actually happened was that there were no antibiotics, but the precursor to the antibiotics were sulfur drugs. And he, there were no sulfur drugs in Poland. I remember them talking about it. And eventually, after six weeks of me being dangerously ill and really being very, they tried everything. They tried Chinese cups on the back and taking blood from my father and all kinds of funny things. And it's really interesting to think of what happened in the 30s. And then he managed to get from Austria, Vienna, those sulfur drugs. And he gave them to me and I started to recover. But when I recovered after quite a few weeks, my lungs were very weak and it was suggested Poland has only got one range of mountains. That's a Tatra mountain then between Poland and Czechoslovakia. Um, the rest of Poland is very is flat and at that time it was very forested and that's an agricultural country. So I went to, to live with Gurale. Gurale is mountain people in huts together with animals. And because my a uh, maternal uh, grandfather was a farmer. I was very familiar with vegetative. I mean, uh, 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 with uh, with um, sorry, I'm getting confused. Uh, with, uh, with 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 uh, I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm, I've lost it for a moment. But anyway, you know, at my age, I'm entitled to do that. Um, you no, know, with the animals. I, I was very, you know, cows and chickens and horses, particularly, which I love. Uh, 
I was very, uh, you know, for me, so we lived together in huts with animals, you know, with ducks and geese and cows and goats and everything like that. And I was a very happy child. I didn't have to say my prayers. I didn't have to study. I didn't have to do. I was running around the mountain and being a very happy child. They, in Shavnitsa, that place called Shavnitsa, they had a bandstand in the park. And on Sundays, the local bands used to come and play music. So, you know, the army band, the police band, the fire brigade, they, you know, school bands, whatever, they used to come and play. So I used to run down from the mountain and I'd sit on the grass and listen. On the way back, Poland is a Marian theocracy. The Holy Mary from Częstochowa is actually a, 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 the patron saint of Poland. And uh, Poland is a very, you know, a, a, a Catholic country. So on the way back, I would stop outside the church. I knew as a child, especially having these blonde, I was blonde and blue eyed, but I had these side locks and everybody would be able to recognize me as being a little Jew. So I would stand outside and I wouldn't go in, I wouldn't dare go inside the church, but I would stand and listen to the wonderful sounds coming out from the organ and the choir. One day, I was so immersed with the music that I forgot myself. I didn't go inside the church. I went towards it and I knelt on the first step outside. And suddenly somebody started hitting me. So I looked up and there was a middle-aged man. And he said to me, how dare you contaminate the holy soil of our church? And he chased me away. And another thing, you know, I used to play with Christian children in wood. But after, sometimes when they got a bit cross, they started, Jude to Palestine, Jews go to Palestine, we don't want you here. So, but apart from that, it didn't really affect me. And, you know, we lived a very happy life. And we were very, very happy. So before the war, absolutely, uh, I didn't have any problems. I started, I read Polish and my mother was finished gymnasium, which, so she gave me Polish books. My father spoke Yiddish and I had to study the Talmud. I had to study the, the holy books and everything else. And, you know, I was bilingual, speaking Yiddish and Polish, and I could read and write at the age of five. I started my teachings and my, and, and my work situation when I was three, three and a half, something like that. And let me bring that photograph up, uh, Pincus, that I had there a moment ago. And maybe you could, uh, I mean, like, like many people who went through the Holocaust, you have very few family photos. Okay, but this is one that I, you have. Yeah, I found this photo in Israel. It was sent, I was at this wedding. And if you look inside, the only young man sitting, his name is Michael. And he got married in 1938, and I was at his wedding. Now, that is his uh, father-in-law, and that's my uncle. Um, uh, his name was Moshe Shloyme Levinzor. And that is my cousin, and that is the one. Now, of these people here, only two survived the war. Of, in this picture, you can only see two of them. This one here and this one here survived the war. All the others were murdered. Michael was actually in one of, he came when I was at Skarzysko in one of these terrible camps. He was shipped from Wuj as a slave worker. And he, because he, I was working outside, but he was working inside with, with assets and others. He lasted three months because they didn't wear any protective clothing. They didn't wear anything. I mean, this is my grandfather, but he was so religious. He didn't like to be photographed. So all you see is you see his beard. But that's the only picture that I've got of, of some of the people, my family. Most of these are my family. So this wedding would have taken place in Woods. How in Woods in 1938, yes. And, uh, and, and the, 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 neither he, Michael, or his, unfortunately, he died in Skarzysko, in, in, in Skarzysko but, but his... His uh, wife and child, he had a child, you know, and he was in the lodge ghetto, and she was sent to Belgium, and she was murdered in Belgium. What were the circumstances, Pincus, behind your family leaving uh, Woods? Uh, my father, when, when the Nazis arrived in Woods, they had, they had lists 
You know, most of you most probably are aware what the fifth column is. You know, when I speak to children, they don't know what, what the fifth column is. The fifth column was, was, you know, there were a hundred, the demographics, that's why I always start with demographics. In Wuj, there were 750,000 people, about three quarters of a million people living there, of which a hundred thousand were ethnic Germans or Austro-Hungarians from the time in Poland for 150 years was occupied by the Prussian, the Russian, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They brought the textile business into the German-speaking people, brought the, the, and became a big center of, of textile manufacture. Wuj became a big center. There were 250,000 Jewish citizens, Polish citizens of Jews, and the rest about, you know, were, were Catholics and other Christian denominations, but 100,000 of them. And they supplied a lot of information amongst them to. To the, to the Germany, to Hitler's Germany, to the Nazis. So when they came in, they had lists. And we were winemakers. Now, my grandfather was the head of an NGO, and uh, he was on one of the lists for some reason. They came to take him, but he was 78. He had the operation a week before the, where the war broke out or something like that. I don't remember exactly how long before, but he was in bed very ill. So two Gestapo men came and I, we, had, we were living in two small apartments with the interleading door because my parents looked after my grandfather and grandmother. So when the bell rang and the war was still raging because it was only about 10 days or so, or, or two weeks, my father went to open my grandfather's front, you know, the door that led from the, in the, from the, from the stairs. So he opened the door and there was these two, now of course I know these were Gestapo men, and they asked for my grandfather. And when they, when my, when they, my father took them into the bedroom and showed them, they said, "What's the matter with him?" So they thought, "Well, we're not going to take him; he's going to die anyway." So they asked my father, "Who are you?" They took him down to the cellars because he told them that he's a winemaker, he's the son. And uh, they took him down to the wine cellars. They beat him almost to death, threw him into a corner, and they told the military police that all the trucks going to the front with the soldiers must come and help themselves. They took everything. They destroyed something that I have records now, still in my possession, which I got after the war, that existed for 70 years. They destroyed it in 24 to 48 hours. And when Wuj was, there were, well, terrible things started happening there, which I'm not going to tell you all about that because we don't have, we have time constraints. But basically what actually happened was, Wuj was going to be incorporated as part of the province of Wartegal. They're going to change the whole province, a Polish province, they're going to change it, incorporate it into Germany, right into the Reich, and they're going to put a border, and that's going to be a border between the rest of what they created, the general government of Poland. That's what they did. So my father had an aunt in Warsaw. Uh, sorry, he had a sister in Warsaw, my aunt, an aunt of ours, but his youngest sister who married a man in Warsaw. And he decided, because we were blonde and blue-eyed, and we, you know, we could pass as Christians, nobody would worry us. I mean, we looked like more Aryan than Aryans. So my, they cut my little side logs, and we went to the train station when Jews were not allowed anymore to uh, take public transport. They weren't allowed to do anything. They became completely, they were outlaws. Jews were, became outlaws. And um, we went to Warsaw, and that's how I finished up in Warsaw. And I'll just go back to that other photo, because I think that this is the lady you were talking about who helped you to get to Warsaw, Pincus. No, this, this was your aunt? This is my aunt when she was uh, in the gymnasium and uh, before, obviously before she got married. And I found this, she sent it to a friend of hers in Israel. This also photo I found in Israel. And these are the only two photos I have, I have of my close family. Mm -hmm. uh, her name was Sabina, the same as my sister. They had the same name. My twin sister was called Sabina and she was Sabina. And her, their name was Spiegelglas. And they lived on a Elektralna number 14 in Warsaw. And what happened to you once you arrived in Warsaw? How long was it before you were forced into the ghetto? Well, my father couldn't, he couldn't take a train because he had a small beard, although he cut most of it, 
but he wouldn't cut completely because he was a very religious person. So you, you can't buy it. You can't cut your beard completely because then he would deny his religiosity. And that was impossible. For him, it was impossible. It was like dying. So he walked. It took him about between two and a half to three months. He already, there was already a border because they created that Bartagao. So there was a border between the general government. So he walked. When he arrived, he found he was a winemaker. He could, we had to make a start making a living. In the beginning, it was kind of schizophrenic. You could do certain things and you couldn't do certain things. It, it didn't, it, did, it started, they started killing people right in the beginning, but the final solution didn't start immediately. So my father found a little apartment, a, a little bedroom and kitchen, which was the side of a school room. It was so small. The front of the building was destroyed by a bomb. But the three other sections of it stayed, and we it was either on the I think it was on the second on the second floor. And he put a little uh, two little kind of uh, com uh, uh, barrels with the linen socks underneath, that kind of linen. And, and he started making wine. He bought raisins on the black market. You can make wine from anything. But for making wine for blessing uh, for Friday night, you have to make it from grapes and raisins are grapes. And I, he would send me out, and this was before the time of the ghetto, and I would be collecting the bottles from cafes. I would go around, you know, and uh, I would bring the bottles and uh, we, would, we would clean the bottles and put them in the water to make them clean. And, and then on Friday, he would give me a rucksack and addresses of Jewish people who could still and Jewish people who still had money and could still afford them. They still wanted to bless the, the, the wine on Friday night. So I would deliver this. And this is how we started making a living. And this is exactly, and my mother had a small kiosk uh, in the same street. We lived in Alevki. We lived on the corner of Mila and Alevki. But we lived in Alevki, which is the Jewish quarter, and it became part of the ghetto. And she had a little kiosk, like, you know, you stood in, you stood in front of the window. And then you sell uh, cigarettes for people who were, were poor. So she would still, I remember that she would sell one cigarette, two cigarettes, and a packet of cigarettes, and some sweets, and one sweet. It, you know, it was, it was very difficult. And for about five, six months, she had this, uh, this uh, kiosk. But apart after that, when the ghetto was closed, dramatically, she couldn't compete with the black market and start anything. So she came back to the house. And in the little kitchen became also a bakery. My mother started making small colors. And when I was delivering the wine, I was also delivering these small colors uh, for Friday night. And this is how they started making a living. And this is the beginning of what happened in, the, in, in Warsaw. But Warsaw was, the, and even before the ghetto, it was just as bad as when, but if I can try, if I would show you what was actually happening, I mean, when I was running around the streets, because I was never scared, don't ask me why I was scared, because I don't know why I wasn't scared. But my sister always was together with my mother, she wouldn't go away in the world. You know, when we were at home, and, and she would only stay at home. I could I couldn't I was claustrophobic, I had to get out into the street. And of course, I was also part of earning a living because I was the deliverer and I would collect the bottles and I would do, you know, go with my father, collect wherever he went. So this is how we, but the, the scenes, for example, before the war together and, and during the war together, for example, soldiers who were on leave, not Nazis, I presume, not nothing special. They had bayonets. They didn't have arms. They, when they are on leave, they only had the bayonet on the left-hand side. And they would catch a few Jews with beards and they would, you know, try and take out their bayonet and try and take off their, their beard. But of course, they would take it with the skin and they start bleeding. And then they would get little girls, young girls or anyone, and like monkeys, they would make them dance. These elderly men, they would make them dance. They would kill themselves with laughter. And this little boy who was blonde, blue eyed, didn't wear a hat, didn't look Jewish, was watching all these things and, and kind of really looking at the eye. My eyes were, and I was recording it, my eyes were like lenses, and the screen of my mind was like a celluloid uh, film. And I was recording all these. And there were many, many scenes, which I can tell you, of the horrific scenes that they were doing. They were beating people, they were robbing people. 
anybody who wasn't Jewish could stop any Jew in the street and take everything out. There was no recourse. You couldn't go to a policeman. There was a blue police, the Polish police who kind of collaborated with the Germans and they called them the blue police because of the blue, you know, they, they, they wore blue clothes. And, uh, and, and this is what was going on. A Jew became an outlaw. You could do anything you, you wanted to. You could kill him, no recourse, nothing. And, and during this whole time, Pincus, you're a young boy. You're basically seven, eight years old when these events well, were taking I was, place. I was actually going on eight when the war started, you know, because I was born in July. So, uh, so when, when, when the war started, I was like going towards eight. And, um, and I, you know, I started my, my, my studying and everything when I was very young, three, three and a half, if I remember, if I, and I remember correctly. So, you know, I was quite, you know, I used to read the newspapers before the war. I used to read Polish books. And, and certainly in, when I was a few months before my father came to Warsaw, I slept in, in my cousin's uh, room when she, she just finished high school. And all the books, I started from one end and I start, finished the other because I was, very, I was a, a really a, a kind of a great reader of books. I love books. My mother was a great reader and she made me rough. So I studied Polish history and all this. So I was quite well developed in, this, in, 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 in terms of, I was still a child, but mm -hmm. the fact is that's why I wasn't scared because maybe if I would have been more developed, you know, intellectually, I would have been fearful, but I wasn't. When do you remember, Pincus, things really starting to deteriorate within the ghetto? Well, things started deteriorating in the ghetto from the beginning of, uh, I would say, beginning of 1941. I remember uh, quite early in 1941, uh, and it was still winter, so so it must have been either February or March or something like that. And I was standing in front, you know, the, there was a big black market and, and the, the Nazis started the big black market. The, the blue police, the, the Nazis, the, there was the Jewish police and there was, okay, oh, oh, it was schizophrenic. It's in a sch schizophrenic hell in, 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 in the Warsaw Ghetto. So I was collecting bottles again, you know, and now going to Jewish cafes. And there were plenty of Jewish cafes started, you know, all these collaborators, all these cooperators, I, I don't want to judge them today, because it's difficult, if you weren't there, and if you didn't experience it, don't judge people with that they did this, that, or the other, it's very difficult to know what actually was going through, people try to save themselves, there were close to about a half a million people in the Warsaw Ghetto by the end of 1941, and they were all starving, so, you know, uh, it's very difficult to do that, so basically, um, just to repeat what you asked me. I was asking when you noticed things really started. Yeah, really, yeah. So basically what happened, is, you know, people started dying from hunger. Because you had so many people, they squeezed in to an area which was less than a two and a half percent of the area of Warsaw, 350,000 uh, uh, people. So basically what, what you, what you, uh, what, what you, actually did. There were nine people to a room, 10 people to a room, seven, eight, depending. They each, each block of uh, apartments had a caretaker and he, in the Jewish community council had us to assign him how many people. And there wasn't enough people. People lived in the streets, people lived in halls and synagogues, and they weren't allowed to, and they didn't have, there wasn't enough to eat. And the people started selling everything what they could. So people started dying. And the scenes that I saw, I mean, there was I standing in front of a cafe and inside there were these collaborators, cooperators, uh, the blue police, the Nazis, dancing, women beautifully dressed and, 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 uh, and then the geese being roasted and the smells of the scent of the geese would come out. And there was this little boy standing outside and next to him was a man dead and, and slowly, slowly more and more. Between 1941 and 42, July 42, when they started with the so-called relocation, but actually deportation to Treblinka to die, 
over nearly 100,000 people died. This little boy saw the Jewish Community Council's burial society going in wooden carts and collecting dead bodies from the streets like you collect rubbish, garbage, and you throw it. They dug a huge pit in the Jewish, in the Jewish cemetery, and they went there, no prayers, no nothing. And they would tilt the cart in it and throw it in like you collect garbage. And this was terribly hurtful to a little boy who was very religious and saw these things. And I, I don't want to tell you all the things that were going on, but these pictures, as I am kind of telling you, these pictures actually, if I could project it onto a screen, you would be able to actually see them because they are completely live in front of my eyes. There I am standing in front of a cafe, looking inside, people dancing, enjoying themselves, drinking wine, music, outside people dying and lying in the streets. And this went on and on and on and on. Now, Pincus, at a certain point, your family made the decision to hide in the bunkers. What, what was going on that prompted that to happen? Well, in, on the 22nd of July, 1942, placards appeared on the wall and the Nazis were very, very shrewd and very clever all the time. The side, they, they said, you are, there are a certain part of the population of Warsaw, you say everybody, just a certain part of the population of Warsaw is going to be relocated. They didn't use the deportation. They didn't use anything like that. They said, got to be relocated. You can take 15 kilo of your goods with you. Each person can take 15 kilos with you. Uh, you're going to go to a place where it's going to be work and fresh air. And um, you're going to uh, uh, you, you go, we're going to give you three kilo bread for the journey. You're going to get marmalade with it. And, and people who were especially people that lived in the streets and were dying in the street ran into the to the Umschlagplatz, the place of where they were the, the wagons were, and they were carted off. Well, there were already reports when the war started with Russia that Jews were being killed because you know. People talk about resistance. Resistance is not resistance with the gun always. Resistance is spiritual resistance, you know, empathy, uh, social re uh, responsibility. These are all resistance. And everything that the Nazis wouldn't allow us to do, we actually tried to do it. There were underground universities in the Warsaw Ghetto. There were, uh, there were uh, you know, a, a self-help society that started kitchens, you know, soup kitchens, where they gave a person a piece of bread and some soup daily, and all kinds of things where, where we, weren't, we weren't allowed to do anything, only to be slave labor. They started, the Germans started, the Germans started factories that are owned, were owned by the banks. They started this. My father, because maybe of his experience of being beaten by the Nazis, didn't trust them at all. So whenever they said, he had all kinds of papers because he was a worker. But whenever they said, you must come down for inspection of documents, my father was mad, we're not going, we're going to be hidden. So we lasted the Warsaw Ghetto for a whole year until the 19th of April, 1943. And slowly, slowly, by the end of September 42, already about 300,000 people were sent to Treblinka and died there. And by that Within six weeks, we knew that Treblinka, we all about Treblinka, we knew about dying. And so we, we, we were trying to hide. And they, you know, I told you that the, in front of the building, the, the front was destroyed by a, uh, by, you know, by a bomb. So underneath these ruins, like in a mine, they built a bunker. My father and all the people living in that area, they built for about 150, they put electricity, water, they put air vents into the ruins to camouflage it. And on the 19th of April, when they came, there were still 50, 60,000 Jews living in the Warsaw Ghetto, of which about a half, 30 or, were living there officially because they were working in factories that the Germans set up. But they decided that now they were going to relocate all these factories somewhere else. And um, but nobody knew when they tell you that they're going to relocate or not relocate, whether or not they're taking you to death. So we went to hide in the bunker as soon. And then, of course, the uprising started. But at that time, they the some 
very young people who had the, you know, who had the military might and everything, and they collected, uh, they started making um, grenades in the Warsaw Ghetto in, in, in cellar. They started making uh, Molotov, Molotov cocktails. You know what a Molotov cocktail is? The Molotov cocktail is a bottle, you put gasoline in it, you put a rag on top, and then when you want to throw it, you wet the rag and you light it, and you throw it into a, a, a wagon full of soldiers, and it bursts or there's a tank. And, and this is how they started. They had a couple of machine guns and some revolvers and rifles, and they started an uprising. So we went down. And we, was, we, we, we spent about three and a half weeks in, in, until the first week in May, we were there. And then they discovered us. And when they discovered us, they said, we are going to destroy the building. We're going to sell, we know where you are. We're going to throw gas bombs between in these you know, air vents. And if you don't come out in half hour, we give you a half an hour. So we came out and then they took us to the Umstadt house. And I'll, I'll project that uh, image again that I had on the screen a moment ago. So when you describe the Umschlagplatz, you're, you're talking about this place where you were waiting for the trains. Yeah, if you, this is the Umschlagplatz. And here are, are a couple of buildings that I can't recognize from this small, uh, from this, small uh, it's, this is the place. And they chased you up to, uh, yeah, up to here. They chased you up into one of these buildings and they, you, we arrived there in the middle of the day, and then we stayed, they pushed us into a schoolroom. It was an old school, an old Jewish school. And they pushed us into a schoolroom. They pushed as many people as they could. And you couldn't even lie down. You either had to stand or squat. My father had a, uh, we were there for a, that whole day that they called us the whole night and most of the next day. All that time, the Ukra they were Ukrainian, Latvian, Lithuanian collaborators with the Nazis, and they were had guns and they were shooting people and killing people. And there was an Ukrainian standing at the door of this uh, classroom and he wouldn't allow anybody to go out. So for all this time, everything you can imagine, women with children, elderly men, younger men, you had to do everything. So. Uh, all the ablutions, you didn't get any food, you didn't get any food to drink. You were there for almost 24 hours or longer, maybe 40 hours without anything. But if the Ukrainian got something of value, then he would give you a bottle of water. So I saw my father taking off the, my mother's wedding ring, which obviously was a gold wedding ring, and he went to the door and he got a bottle of water. He had a sock of sugar and he had a teaspoon and he would give the two children, you know, my sister and I got a teaspoon of sugar from time to time and a little bit of water. My parents never touched it. And then they chased us when the time was right for them, they chased us into the wagon. Onto the trains. And where did you go from that point? Well, they pushed us into the trains and my father was like an angel. He guarded us right to the, to, to the bitter end. So, you know, there are these, these, you can see here and this, you can see the barbed wire on these little windows. So he pushed us towards the windows because he obviously knew what was going on. I didn't. And they pushed so many people in that you were like a tin of sardines. You, you, you could only stand, but they pushed so many people people in that it was very difficult to breathe. So my father took my mother and the two children and started pushing, pushing them towards. So we were actually very near to this window. So we could breathe. And I don't know how long it took. And I thought myself, we are now going to die. We're going to Treblinka because I knew all these tra the trains, you know, these cattle trucks go to Treblinka. And, um, and that was it. And I don't know how long the journey took. I, I, I have no idea. I know quite a few people died. When we came to the end, they took quite a lot of people that died from suffocation, elderly people who couldn't take it anymore. And then they chased us out of the wagons. And when we came out, people started saying, this is Lublin. Okay, I didn't know what Lublin was. I didn't know where we were. And then we started walking and we came to a place, which afterwards, of course, I, 
the, a couple of days later, I, or the, the day later, I knew it was the Maidanic death camp. And when we arrived there, they separated men from women and uh, the children who were on their own, women with children, women without children. <coughs> my father saved my life. He told me, you must say, I was very tall for my age. I was 11 at the time. He said, you must say that you are five years older. And I have documentation because the Germans, when you were a slave worker, they kept very... So I have recommend, recommend, recommend all, all the records from the Buchenwald where I was born in 1927, not 32. So I was a grown up. So I went to my father. And then my sister was separated from my mother and she was pushed with the children. And I was watching my mother and suddenly I saw my sister running towards my mother. She had this very beautiful long blonde braid. And I was watching the braid. And then she went and hugged my mother. And so I saw her from the back and I was watching the braid. And unfortunately, this brain that has got such photographic memory and can see everybody and everything and knows exactly what happened, cousins and uncles and great uncles. And I can recognize everybody in the photographs that I see. Anybody that I, I knew, people that lived in Warsaw that survived and people that didn't survive. Michael. But I can't remember anything about my sister. We lived together for 11 years. We were born together. We did. We, and the first time I told this, which is quite many years ago, in 2000, and, uh, actually in 1992, is when the first time I told the story, uh, I broke down. Because, you know, can you imagine that not even, never mind not having a photograph, but not even having it in your mind. So that when I think of it, all I see is a brain. And I can, and I know it's Sabina. Sabina represented by a brain. And when they made the virtual reality film of 18 minutes when I was Maidanek, the virtual time that they ever made the virtual film, and uh, you know, usually, I don't know why, they always make me be the guinea pig. <laughs> Whenever they start something new in IT, they, they ask me to do it. So I went to Maidanek and, and then when they put the, uh, and when they were the premiere at the Tribeca Festival in New York, they made the, post, a po a, the poster where they put the braid and it's called, it's called the last goodbye. And that's, and so they took away the men, the women and the children and everybody else and we were standing and waiting. And then they pushed us into a barrack and they told us to undress naked. So we were running naked and there was a little man, quite a short man with a white coat. I don't know whether he was a doctor or not. And he, had a little stick and he pushed people right, left, right, left, right, left, left. I, came, I came into a room, I saw shower heads, and we knew in Warsaw Ghetto, they tried to fool you and put shower heads in the guest chambers. And then guest comes out and you, so I started saying my prayers and waiting to die. But in my case, water came out. After that, I got the prison clothes, you know, wooden clogs, you know, all these, this uh, round head, and, and, and they chased us out from a roll call. So I started looking at my father and my mother because I thought myself, if I'm alive, they didn't kill us. Maybe they want us to work or something like that. Because they kept on saying that you're going to go to work, but in actual fact, they used to talk. So I ran around and I saw a man that used to come and sleep in our little kitchen at night, we a street person, which I recognized. And I said, I ran to, up to him and I said, have you seen my father? Where's my father? And he didn't answer, he wouldn't answer. And then suddenly, he just lifted his eyes to heaven. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew it was something bad. I didn't know what. The next day, I found out that both my father and my mother and twin sister were murdered by the Nazis the day we arrived in Maidanek, in the death camp Maidanek. And if you go there today, you can actually see exactly when, where, where we were running. If you go to the right, you go into the shower head, and if you go to the left, you go to the guest chamber. I've heard you tell that story a number of times, Pincus, and it still pulls me in as, as much as it ever did. Your, your ability to talk about that is, uh, is incredible. It's, it's why I, I really like to have you meet with my students whenever it's possible. And this is, of course, the cover of your book, which I think um, captures that image very, very compellingly. 
Yeah, that's the that's the book that I that was published in 2000 and I think in 2019 or 2018. I'm not quite sure when. I, I, I didn't, or maybe 2017. I don't remember exactly when. It was uh, definitely pre-pandemic. I remember going to the book launch. It was pre-pandemic. It was. Yeah. It, it was a. It was at the uh, at the uh, Y in the on corner of of the diner and uh, and 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 Bloor and Bloor. Um, yep. and uh, in a big in that big hall and, uh, that's where it was it was published by the Azrieli foundation yep and i was going to mention they're a, a great institution dedicated as well to preserving the memory and the testimony of so many different uh, holocaust survivors now pinkus how long were you in maidanak i was in maidanak for three months and I always believe in providence. And the reason why I survived Maidanek, because Maidanek was a place of terror. They terrorized you. Most of the guards were Ukrainians. And they hated Jews, you cannot imagine, or hated anybody, because Maidanek had five camps. And amongst these five camps, weren't the only Jews. There were Russian prisoners of war. There were a lot of Polish resistance. There were a lot of Polish political prisoners, a lot of Polish women. Uh, there was a whole story of Zamash, which I can't tell you about how they brought women and children to Maidanek and some of them were actually gassed and killed. And I'm talking about Polish Catholic citizens. And um, they played games. Apart from that, every day they had work commanders. And the work commanders, instead of using tractors, and, uh, and, and uh, rollers and stuff like that to build roads, they used human beings. So if you go to Maidanek today, you can see the rollers still. And they would spin in people like you spin in horses. But in the meantime, they would also split your heads with, with spades. The Ukrainians loved to do that. And they used to, if you went out to work and you came back, there were always a few bodies were being carried back to the, to the camp because you couldn't leave bodies outside. They had to be burned in the crematorium. So and, I was there for three months. And the reason why I survived is because providentially, I subconsciously, by osmosis actually, I felt that I must make myself invisible. There was the commander of the camp was a fiend about cleanliness. So we had little gardens in front of the, today they aren't there anymore, but the gardens in front of each barrack. So when we started there, they started shouting, where commander, where commander, I would lie down and I would make myself clean the garden. You know, I was working in the garden, you know, with my, with my, with my backside up and lying on the ground and working. And when somebody, uh, one officer would come and say, what are you doing here? I would, because I spoke German from Yiddish, I would say the Block elderster, you know, the man, man member, you know, in charge of the block told me that I must look after the flowers and weed and so forth and so on. And this is how I got away. Once I was called, you know, for a work commando, but they were playing games. So th there was a huge mountain of stones. And they said, we must take these stones and run about a half mile and to another place. So I thought, well, they're building something. So we ran and they started beating us on the way. And when all the stones were there, Suddenly, we were told you have to run back and put the stones in the same place. So basically, you know, it was like torture. They, it was a place, if you go to the, to the peace system, because Lublin is very near. It's one of, one of these camps, one of the death camps, which was near a city. You could actually see the city out of it. And, and if you talk to people, Christian people today, they re re always remember it as Maidanek was the place of torture. They don't talk about talk, they don't talk about it. And fortunately for me, after three months, I was sent to another so-called working camp, uh, also a camp where there were selections for, but they didn't guess you. They used to take you to the forest and, and murder you and shoot you if you couldn't work anymore. So I was in, in, in I was in Skarzysko for about a year and I survived that because of grace of God and 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 a Jewish policeman who had a sick wife who made me a nurse and I used to work 12 hours a day and then come back and again and I was like a hospital nurse I would clean it because the Jewish police inside the camp they had, they were privileged the administration of the inside camp was was done like in the ghetto 
It was like Jewish, and they were all cooperators, collaborators. They tried to save their life. And they had very good rations, and they they could keep they have the families with them and everything else. And, um, and and I so he used to help me, and this is how I I survived Skarzysko. Then I went to Chase the Chova, which was like Hamilton. I spent anyway. I'll stop now. Yeah, I wanted to ask one other question about Skarzysko because I know you have a, a remarkable story. You turned thirteen there, and actually, no. had your, or was that my daughter? No, it was in the next camp. Oh, in Chestahova, okay. In Chestahova. So please tell the story of your bar mitzvah. I think it's one yeah. of the more incredible ones that we now, can Now, Chestahova was like a sanatorium. Why was it in a sanatorium? Because the Jewish commander of the, again, it was like a little, you know, place where the interior administration was Jewish with the Jewish police and the Jewish administration and everything. And he somehow, his name was, if I remember correctly, his name was Franco. He died in, in Buchenwald. And he had an arrangement with the Ukrainians and with the Germans. We never saw a German inside the camp and nobody died inside that camp. As a matter of fact, one boy had appendicitis. They sent him to the Polish hospital in Zestochowa and operated, he came back and he survived the war. It was an incredible camp. The only time, the only person who died there is a youngster who went to the gate, to the uh, wires, you know, and uh, the, 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 and the Ukrainian that was on the, you know, on, on, on duty decided maybe he wanted to run away, so he shot him. But if he hadn't gone, when, gone near to the wires, he would have been alive. So you weren't allowed to pray, you weren't allowed to do anything. But when I arrived at that camp, after being a year in Skarzysko and being not in a very good condition, I found there that Harav Godel Eiser, a rabbi, who went to the yeshiva together with my father. And my father, despite being a winemaker, was also an ordained rabbi because people that finished the, the yeshiva, like, a, like the Talmudic, everything, can become rabbis. Because rabbis are teachers, they are not necessarily priests. It's, uh, you know, some of them become, but basically people don't understand that the rabbi, actually the word rabbi is a teacher. And um, so he said, look, I was at your circumcision. I think you are going to be 13. And uh, regardless, I'm going to make you bar mitzvah. So at midnight, I wasn't in his barrack. So one person from his barrack went to sleep in my barrack. And he, at midnight, he got 10 people and he had a, a, a prayer shawl and he had a, a, the philosophers. I don't know how he got them, how they be, can be get in the camp. I told you, spiritual resistance is, 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 is more important than guns. And, and he had all the paraphernalia to make a bar mitzvah. He made me say the prayers and then he blessed me and he said, with God's help, you will survive Hitler. And he said it in Yiddish to me, but why didn't they help us to Hitler? And, you know, this is, this is the camp in Chestochova. And I was there for about four months. And because this Franco was such a good commander and so he made so much, he so organized himself with the Germans or the whoever was in charge there, that we also had better rations. We worked hard. We worked like in Hamilton. It was a steel, steel making. So we worked. I had to load two wagons daily. That was my, you know, 12 hours work and two wagons of steel. Steel that was just finished. And I had to put steel and load on it. And I was quite young at the time. But we got better rations and we, we survived. That. We were there for months. After that, they when the Russians were came near, they put us on wagons again, and we went to Buchenwald. Buchenwald was a horrific place. It was a place of cannibalism, no food. Um, and fortunately, it, our, we were sold to a company, a German company owned by the Dresden Bank, the Deutsche Bank, the banks that exist today. They were owned, just the shareholders were these big banks. But they were uh, uh, making armaments, and it was called Hassak, an acronym Hugo Schneider Aktiengesellschaft. And 
So they came looking for us because they, we were workers that they knew can do some work for them. So they took us out of Buchenwald. So fortunately for us, they took us to a place called Kolditz, where they made, where we were making Panzerfaust. Panzerfaust for bazookas, anti-tank bazookas. So I was there. And uh, again, I only believe that it can be providential. And I've got to tell you the story. When we arrived there, we were on a roll call. And by that time, the officers were very low uh, officers. They weren't any, they weren't lieutenant, they were usually sergeant. So the, the commander of that, we did, weren't even a barrack. We had, they had a huge hall, which they locked up with big gates. And then they put bunks in there. And that's where we slept. There were about 1,500 of us. When we arrived, there was a roll call. And he said, of those kind of boom, there was an outside. If there are young people here, they must step out. Well, normally nobody steps out of a young because young people can't work or, and they're ready to be killed. This is what normally happened in all the camps. Youngs were being pulled out and sent to the guest chamber or shot or killed. I stepped out. I was the only one who stepped out. There were other young people there. I was quite tall for my age, but I stepped out. And I stood there and he allocated this work group, this work group, that when everybody kind of was allocated and I stood there by myself. And when he finished doing all the work that he did, he took me by the hand and took me to the SS kitchen. And he said, you've got to work here. You know what that means? Working in the SS kitchen, you know, with potatoes and carrots and apples and uh, meat being cut and cut and you have to and you clean up those big vats and and inside there are whole pieces of meat so much so very interestingly Harav Gottel Eisner who I hadn't seen after he was in Chenstochova suddenly they must have taken him from Chenstochova to a place called Schlieben and from Schlieben they took him to to uh, Kolditz and I found him there so in the evening when I came back and they gave us uh, uh, the soup and bread I would give him my portion because I had to eat. I had my fill and more in the in the SS kitchen. So and he survived the war. He survived the war and he lost his wife and he lost his children and he went to Israel and he married and he had a second wife and he had several children and he lived and became a head of a yeshiva and he lived to a ripe old age and he died not so long ago. He was in his late nineties. So this is how providence works. You can never work it out. And I'll show some of those images to, to catch up to your story really quickly. Uh, in terms of the locations and everything, just uh, make the map a little bit bigger here. Maidanek, Skarzysko, and then um, over to, uh, to Chestahoa on the, on the border. So Pincus is basically moving from east to west and ultimately into Germany itself. And this is an old artifact I found, Pincus, of the Hasig company that you were That's working with. Yeah. Yeah, Hugo Schneider, were... actually, yeah. Yeah, and it was the same company that you were working for in a succession of camps, correct? I beg your pardon? Was it the same company? That yeah, you the same for? company. They, I worked for them in Skarzysko, in Częstochowa, in Kolditz. Mm. And these this are... Is, the... This is from, uh, this is from, you see here, it says born 21st July 27, but the next year first is 21st of July 32. So when did you get this card? I mean, this was, of course, the identity card that the, that the Nazis oh, it's, built. Yeah it, it, yeah, it followed me, you know, from place to place. And this was, this is, I, I got it from, I went to Buchenwald, um, you know, on one of my trips to Poland uh, and to Germany. So I went to Buchenwald and um, as a matter of fact, this particular thing, I got, uh, they made a documentary called Politische Polish Jude. Uh, if you move that across a little bit, if you can, because I can't see all of it, you, 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 yeah. if you just take you show the card itself. Yeah, let me just, uh, I'll adjust there in a second. Oh, hang on. Yeah, and I'll move that over. Yeah. If you look, look here, it, it, it's got, it's, you make it a bit bigger if you can. Yeah. Yeah. If you see here, the triangle shows uh, that I'm a political prisoner. Uh, so the P is for Polish and it's a political prisoner. 
and that's my number, 115-800. And it shows exactly where I was born, Zachonia 54 in Wuj. And then they, they, of course, put the name Litzmannstadt, which I told you uh, they changed the name. And that here it says Politische Pole Jude, that I'm a political Polish Jew. And uh, so when the documentary, they, I, 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 we went down to make a documentary. And when we came to Buchenwald, when I found out that they had all the documentation from me, there were more documents. They both actually got them at Yad Vashem also. They got it from the Germans, more documents than this. But this is the one that gives every, you know, the kind of one of the main documents. And mm -hmm. uh, so when we went there, and uh, they made the documentary Political Polish Youth by the, um, it was made by the, uh, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. They decided to make a, a documentary about my life and work here. So we went all over, Poland, Germany, everywhere. And, um, and this is what they gave me. Uh, and here, they, I, it says a photo, and I've been looking for that photo when I was there, but they couldn't find it. So uh, it said here number 955, and there is a photo of me there, but they couldn't, um, they, they couldn't find it. As a matter of fact, there's even a, another document which I signed, and I signed with my Polish name, Pine, <laughs> my, my small handwriting, and another one where it says Guter, which I signed with G-U-T-E-R, because that's, this is, but they, of course, they, they all, Guter is with the two T's, and this is how it started. That's why, you know, I went on being Pinchas Guter. They didn't even properly spell my name, they spelled Pinkus instead of Pinchas. You know, when you said Pincus, they said Pinchas. And by this time, Pincus were is certainly getting towards the end of the war. And, you know, there's more, more terror that you're going to be subjected to in the death marches. Well, around about the end of March or beginning of April, the Americans were coming near for some reason. I, I, I don't know the whole history of, of, of that part of the world, exactly who was coming, but we were near... Leipzig. Kolditz was not far from Leipzig, which is part of, I think, Eastern Germany. And um, it was, and also not far from Dresden. And um, they decided, God knows why, that as the, we were told that the Americans were coming, that's what the, 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 the noises were in the camp, in the hall that we were. And they, one day, we stopped working and they said march out so they gave us actually i must say at the time they gave us a bread they gave us a sausage they gave us cheese uh, for some reason maybe because we were working for this hazard whatever it was i don't know what they what they had in their mind but they gave us quite a bit of what call it. and we started marching and in the evening, the guards, and one of them was actually a Folkstorch, a Polish Folkstorch. You know, there were Poles who were drafted into the army because they had G German ancestry or something like that. So he came and spoke to us in Polish and he said, look, the Americans are coming and you are going to be free. You are going to be free. You are going to be free. And he started also saying, oh, I'm going to change now. I'm in, in, you know, he was a kind of a corporal or something like that. And he's got to change. And because they're going to catch him and he's going to be, they're going to kill him. And then suddenly, within half an hour, a whole regiment of SS came. They started shooting in the air and, they, and we were in a kind of forest and they made us lie with our, with our faces in the, in, in the ground and said, if anybody lifts their head, we're going to shoot them. And the next day, these individuals started a march and we started marching. They didn't give us any food, whatever we got from the beginning lasted about a day or two. And after that, we were eat, drinking water from ditches, you know, that dirty water or whatever, catching whatever. I mean, people were like going, whatever they could catch, anything that was flying or anything that, that moved, we, leaves. I mean, you know, in the, at night we were sometimes in the barn and we find corn, you know, the, kind of raw corn and we'd eat it and sometimes there was there, there was a, 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 pump, a water pump 
and we would go and get some water. But generally, we went out approximately, there were about 1,500 of us. And we marched for several weeks. And I don't even remember how long. And we marched from Kolbitz all the way to Trezenstadt. By the time we arrived in Trezenstadt, only half of us arrived. And I think that the only reason that I survived that, because it was extremely difficult, but there were two reasons. One, because I had worked in the SS kitchen and I could fat myself out. When I arrived from, from Buchenwald to Kolditz, I weighed 40 kilos. I was quite tall, but I weighed 40 kilos. 40 kilos is like what? I can't remember how many pounds, but I was skin. I was skin and bones, but I fattened myself up by working about three or four months from January to April. I, I worked in, 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 in this SS kitchen. And the second is that sergeant who was our commander, he gave me a bag and he said, because food was scarce, he said, while you are doing things in the kitchen and peeling potatoes and carrots and stuff like that, whatever you can, just put it in the bag and put it in a place and he showed me where the place is. And I actually risked my life to do that because if they would catch me, they would think that I'm stealing it for myself. And I would tell them, no, I'm doing it for the sharf here. And they would say, no, never mind. But I did it and I was never caught. Or maybe they knew about this, I don't know. So every time I lagged behind, you know, people that lagged behind, they would either shoot them or they would drop dead. He, would, he was the only one who had the bicycle. He had the, you know, he's the ordinary bicycle. And he would kind of, the other guards had walked with us. And as he saw me kind of getting out of the, he would come and he would push me back into the roads and he'd say, you're not, you don't want to die. You don't want to die. And he pushed me back. And also they would shoot hares and stuff like that. And from time to time, he would come up. Obviously he had some feelings for me. So he would give me a piece of meat or something like that, whatever they ate. So I was better off than, than everybody else. So either my father, the angel was, was watching me or Providence, but somehow or other I survived that walk and half of us didn't. And what I was liberated on the 8th of May by the Russian army. What do you remember about that day, Pincus? It's a long story, actually. <laughs> but I mean, you ask me a question, I always have stories. Now, what happened is this. We woke up one morning and shouting, everybody was shouting, we are free, we are free, we are free. The guards have disappeared, the gendarmes have gone, the gates are open. And not everybody could go out. Most people in, in also were starving in, in Trezestad. Was, it was a typhoid epidemic. It was really very bad. And But I was I already had typhoid in Skarzysko. So I was immune to typhoid. And and I was reasonably well. well. I, I could I, I still had strength. So because in the few weeks that we were in, in Trezestad, we didn't get hardly any food. But I still had kind of things left over from my work at the SS kitchen. So I ran out and there was these Russian Uzbeks and Kyrgyzians and it was all Asiatic uh, uh, infantry walking and they had Well, hopefully Pincus will come back in a moment there. Oh yes, he froze, huh? Yeah, it looks like. I've got to tell you, Scott, this is what a story and what a memory he has. I'm just, uh, I'm stunned by it. And I'm stunned that he's able to, to talk about it so readily. It's, it's almost, I think he, he has a hard time probably not talking yeah. about it when he starts. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've sat down with him and, and talked for hours in, in the company of some of my students. You know, we, we got the chance to see him at the Toronto Holocaust Center on a few occasions when he's been talking to different groups. But he is, 
just an incredible and inspirational man. And just the, the story of how he got talking itself uh, is pretty remarkable. And hopefully we'll get rejoined by him in just a moment. I'm sure he's trying to trying to log back in. Uh, but I remember asking him one time about uh, when he started telling his own family. And it wasn't until his children were grown and you know he had such a compelling story about what it was like the first time he shared his story with his daughter um it was almost like he got transported to another place and then all of a sudden he no noticed that his daughter was you know really crying uncontrollably and he had to sort of catch himself and uh you know find a way to share his story and he he has told it many times and he is just remarkable to listen to you know every time he has uh has something to say uh I, it's a it's a real occasion when my students have the have the chance to meet him do you think you might need to send him the link again to this meeting or because uh, i'm not sure i have his contact information the other yeah. thing i wanted to ask is and I just want to clarify, maybe somebody in the audience who, who uh, listened, uh, understood it. When he said he can't remember his sister, mm -hmm. does he mean that he can't remember her really at all? Or just in the camp, her last day there? It's, I think it's just more so the image. It's, I mean, it's got to be something that um, somehow he subconsciously blocks out. The fact that he, he has no photographs of his family, and that's a fate that befell many Polish Jews as they were herded onto the train. Some of them, you know, tried everything they possibly could to keep those photographs, but a lot of people lost them. So he just, he just doesn't have a physical representation. Many people at a later point were lucky enough to get photographs of relatives that, you know, right. might've been sent in the mail or something like that. But Pincus, unfortunately, was never able to, to reconnect with his family. So when, when he talks about not being able to remember her, her face, that, that really is what he means. I uh, taught, and I'm sure you've taught before, the get, uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, of such a dramatic event. And I know that one of the things that fueled the uprising, remarkably successful, you know, for, oh, for there what he it is was, coming back there in. he is. <laughs> um, and I found it interesting that he said they, they knew in the ghetto what was happening at the concentration camps. And that was one of the things that fueled the uprising. They knew that this was uh, hurtling toward death for all of them. Yeah, for some, for some reason it was it was disconnected. I don't know what happened. Yeah, can you, can you, uh, we are there. And it got frozen and it got disconnected, and I'm back now. So yeah. I was telling you the story about uh, deliberation. So That's we, right. Yeah. So I don't know what we point to. So we ran out. I I ran out with other people, and we saw these uh, Russian soldiers with the. Uh, their blanket, they had a, a bandolier on one side, the blanket rolled up, on the other side, bullets and a Tommy gun, and they had uh, these big uh, boots, and one side they had tobacco, the other side they had paper, they would roll machorka, and uh, they had the bread on one side and, and, and meat on the other side, and they were really enjoying themselves. And they did things which I couldn't understand. You know, they were the Czechs were chasing out the the Germans that were settled, you know, uh, ethnic cleansing that the that the Nazi did that by chasing out all the Czechs from Moravia and, and, and places like that from Bohemia, and then settled with millions of Germans. They were chasing them now out. And and we watched as millions of well, no, hundreds of thousands of people were being chased out. There were prams with little children uh, and, uh, and and so forth and so on. And they were suffering, and, and, and we felt sorry for them, despite the fact that for five years I, I suffered under the Germans. But when you see people suffering, then you can't help yourself. And I spoke to other youngsters that were around there, and we all felt sorry for these people. And we saw scenes where they were catching women. Of course, I didn't know at the time what they were doing, but they were going to be taking them. I presume they were raping them. And then I saw two horses with a wagon standing in a field. And because of my grandfather, the farmer, I was very familiar with horses and with animals generally. So I ran out just to snuggle with the horses. You know, I love the smell of the horses. To me, horses were like wonderful. So I kind of stayed there and I watched. I was waiting for the owner to come. And I stayed and I stayed and I played with them. Nobody came. Eventually, I got up onto the wagon, took the whip, you don't, hit the horse, you just show them the whip. That I learned when I was a child still. And 
I took the reins and I said, Vio, like in Poland. And they started going left, right, and I drove into the, into the camp. And I, I kind of appropriated those two horses. And, for, and, and then after a couple of days, uh, one of the administrators from the Russians and the Czechs came to me and asked me, are these your horses? I said, yes. And he said, would you like to work for us as a contractor? I said, yes. So for three months while I was in, in Dresdenstadt, I became a contractor. I would bring uh, food and others, whatever I need. I loaded it. I, I made a stall from a ruined building because there was no stall where I could keep the horses at night. And very often I used to sleep. I, I fed them. I did everything. And for three months, I was like, they became my family. And I'll tell you the, the last bit about these horses. When we were told that we are going to be taken to England, to orphanages for re re rehabilitation, I said, I, I started going to this Czech guy and I said, look, you, you can't, I can't leave my horses. What am I going to do with my horses? So he was very clever. He said, look, horses, you're going to go with the airplanes to, to England. And we, we did actually with Wellington bombers. But he, he said, horses can't go on airplanes, but they can go on ships. So when we, and of course, being a little boy, I believed everything he said. He said, with, with, when, we, when, you, when you go there, we are going to ship. And as soon as they arrive in the port, we're going to tell you, you can come get your horses. And of course, I'm still waiting for those horses. It's going to take a long time for those horses to arrive. But at that time, I believed him. And, the, and I, because before that, he didn't say that. He's kind of saying, no, no, you must go, you must go. So I started crying. A little boy starts crying. I'm only, I was only, I was turning 13. I wasn't even 13 yet. But, you know, he, he, he persuaded me and he told me, we're going to send the horses. So this is the beginning of my life after the war. Now, Pincus, how did you end up in England? What's the story there? Uh, well, the United Nations UNRWA, the United Re Nations Re Relief and Rehabilitation Agency, uh, made a deal with the British government that they would allow a thousand children, Holocaust survivors, uh, under the age of 16 to come for rehabilitation in England. And we were the first in Theresienstadt, they came looking for us. There were only about 300 odd. And as a matter of fact, there were a lot of them much older. They were 18 and 19, and they made them younger. You know, they kind of, they changed the date as soon after we arrived because everybody knew that, that there weren't many people, many youngsters under the 16. I was one of the few. And there were some, there were some about, I would say about 30 or 40 of us were actually about from the 300 odd, uh, they were, they were, most of them were over 60, 16 or, or, or older. And uh, they flew us to a place called Windermere, which is the Lake District. And for several months, we were there for rehabilitation. And then after that, they took us to orphanages. I went to a, a very religious orphanage. In Hopefully this will just be for a moment, but uh, we know that Pincus knows how to how to get back if he was. Oh, there he is. So uh, Pincus, you just froze there for for a moment. I know. I, it, I, don't, I wonder why it happens. I'll bring up a photo on the screen because uh, there's a. It a says great your photo. internet connection is unstable for some reason. I don't know mm. why. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's that's just uh, life in Zoom. Can you tell people, Pincus, the story of this photograph right here? Yeah, well, this is this is Mr. Diamond because I didn't want to, I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to uh, uh, be on charity. With. So at the age of fourteen, I left the yeshiva and I started. I didn't want to be in an orphanage and I wanted to start working. So when I was fourteen years old, I started working, and I lived with uh, I, I I boarded with a family called Diamonds, and and he was the patriarch of the family. He had five children, and this is Mr. Diamond. He would, he actually lived to very old age, ripe old age, with a very short man, and he always had cigars. He wasn't very wealthy, but he, I think he had a hobby about smoking cigars. This is me with my first uh, uh, suit that I got uh, when I was in England in the orphanage, actually, before I went to the Diamond family. And this is me in uh, driving a Jeep when I volunteered, I didn't go as an immigrant. Actually, when I turned 18, I volunteered to go to Israel 
and I joined the Israeli army. I went as a volunteer for the Israeli army. And this is Dorothy, uh, when we got married, uh, the, the two of us, um, uh, we got married in England. I went back to England after five years uh, being in Israel, after I spent uh, three and a half, uh, two and a half years in the army and, and another two and a half years uh, working and doing all kinds of things. And then I went back to England and I got married to Dorothy. And that's uh, the day of our wedding. We got, we got married in the afternoon and then we missed the diamond. I was living, of course, with the diamonds at that time. And Mr. Diamond made the tea. And after that, we went to cinema. I mean, you know, it, it, uh, we didn't have honeymoon or anything like that. I didn't have my money. <laughs> I was very poor. And this is me as a youngster. I'm driving this Jeep. Uh, and uh, I was in an anti-aircraft unit. And I was a sergeant. Eventually, I was a sergeant in the, in the army. And I, I, I was hoping to become an officer. But because I had no schooling, they, they sent me to a sergeant's course. But I, but I didn't, uh, I, I couldn't become an officer. But I didn't, that didn't bother me. I, I was very, I was very happy child. For the first 10 years, I had no suffering about it all from the Holocaust. I didn't think of anything. I didn't do, it was only after 10 years that my brain did something. And I started having these terrible nightmares and started suffering from my experiences during the war. But the first 10 years from, you know, until, you know, uh, you know Nothing until 1955, uh, from 45 to 55, uh, I learned nothing. And one day I was in a restaurant on a, on a Saturday uh, with my friends. I was still in the army, and uh, no, no, I wasn't in the army. I was, I was, uh, no, it was, it was. Uh, I had left the army already, and. Uh, and, and it was a Saturday, and in those days, all the Israel was very religious, and you you had to buy your your uh, ticket to be able to have lunch in a restaurant because you couldn't pay money, and it was all very very religious. So we were there in the Hungarian restaurant, and we were eating, and I fainted, just for a few seconds actually. They poured some water over me, and I was fine. And that night, I had my first nightmare, and I started having very bad sufferings from the Holocaust for quite many years. And it was thanks to Dorothy, my wife, uh, that actually, you know, that I'm still around because she looked after my children. I worked very hard. We were very poor for many, many years. And uh, I struggled. Uh, we had three children. And, um, and uh, she, uh, she looked after the children. She went to, you know, to the schools and when she had a teacher, a parent teacher, you know, I couldn't, I wasn't, I couldn't go because when I came home from work, I was so finished that I, 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 I would kind of almost collapse. And so she was like the, the homemaker, the looker after, and the and when I scrammed during the night with my nightmares, she would keep me calm and she helped me a lot. And, and I, everything that I can, I can have to thank her because she was a wonderful, my wife, Dorothy, it was, it was, was an absolutely also uh, uh, an, is a, an incredible person, and and thank God we 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 we've been together. We we got married. We just this January this year was on the 65th anniversary. Very nice. I was just going to mention happy anniversary. I recall you saying that to me not uh, not too long ago. Pincus, when did you start to share your story yourself? When did you start to speak to school groups and that kind of thing? Well, it was, uh, lo it, it was not so long ago because um, the first time I told my story was in a cemetery where I was asked on the Holocaust day Yom HaShoah, to speak at the cemetery in East London. By that time, I was living in South Africa, in Cape Town, because my wife is a Cape Townian, and she wasn't a Holocaust survivor or anything. We got, she was studying in England. That's why we got married in England. And then eventually, I didn't want to go to South Africa because of apartheid, and I finished working. I found a job in South America, of all places. And, you know, wherever I could work, I would go work because I wanted to earn a living. And it was so it was difficult. Eventually, uh, we had already one child and my wife and I, we were pregnant with the second one and my and her mother and I had no family and she, she had her family and they insisted. So eventually I finished up in South Africa against my better will and I wasn't very happy with anyone. 
but the, 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 what actually happened was that uh, now I lost my train of thought. What did you say? I, I was asking about when you started sharing your story with school. Oh, yeah, yeah. So basically, in, 19, in 1967, somebody asked me to go to the cemetery in East London because that's where they, in South Africa, that the Jewish community is always in the cemetery. So although I was living in Cape Town, I had a very close friend whose brother was living in East London. So I went there. He flew me down and I spoke. And that, as soon as we finished and came back to his room, I started shaking and shivering. And they gave me something uh, to knock me out. And, and then I went back and I decided I'm never ever going to talk about it. And I said, certainly didn't speak to my children. I didn't want to make them suffer and experience, you know, like having children of Holocaust survivors suffer because they, they live with their father's story. It was bad enough that I was suffering and I tried to keep it as much away from them. And so did my wife. And thank God we managed to do that. <laughs> so when I came to Canada a, in 1985, there was a woman here called Paula Draper. She was a professor of a historian at the University of Toronto, and she was taking uh, testimony from Holocaust survivors. And somehow they must have found out, she must have found out, I don't know, from somebody that I was a Holocaust survivor. And she tried to convince me to tell my story. And I said, no, 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 no. And one day she phoned me and she said, can I come and have a cup of tea with you? And I said, obviously, I'm not a polite person. So she came to our apartment and she sat down and she convinced me it was important, and this was in 1992, that it was important that I should make my testimony. And she originally she was going to do two hours, and she had she had a television studio which gave her time in the evening twice a week, and eventually she did the four hour. And that documentary is actually available, and and where I speak for four hours. This is my first documentary that I actually gave at all ever, and she persuaded me because she said at least. You'll give it to your children. I'm going to make special videos, and then you can give it to your children, and then they will know what you went through. So I agreed to that. But I didn't speak. And then, of course, um, I, uh, in, 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 uh, I met up with Stephen Smith. And he when, was they were doing, when, they were doing the, when they were doing the Holocaust Center in Cape Town. And because I used to go back to Cape Town quite regularly at one stage, uh, the, uh, the, the, he, he interviewed me also, and he persuaded me to go and go back to Poland and take my family there and tell my story. And he would make a documentary for the BBC, which he did. And it's called the documentary. It was the first one that is actually was published and it's called The Void. And because we couldn't find, he wanted to find things and he couldn't find very much. He went to Poland with my whole family and that became easy for me. And then he persuaded me to start talking. And I started my first trip was with Catholic educators from the United States in 2005. So I only started talking to people from the year 2005. That's, that's all. So it's not such a long time because for a long time, I mean, I didn't even want to belong to Holocaust survivors uh, in, in Cape Town. They had a Holocaust survivors uh, kind of circle of friends and, and association. And I didn't even want to join them because I knew that they would try and tell me, get me to talk about it. And I didn't want to. So I, because of, I suffered for very badly for a long time, it took me a long time to get over it. And, and I had to work and I had to look after a family. So it was very difficult. And it was only in 2005. And, it, and also the empathy from these Catholic educators, who was a bishop and nuns, these were all from a university of Southern, of St. Uh, Elizabeth from New Jersey. And uh, I went with two buses uh, of, of theirs. And, um, and we went first to, to, to Czestochowa, to where they had a mess with the, the Catholic, with the Holy Mary, the Black Madonna from, from Jestochowa, Matka Boska, and uh, they, and, and it was really a, a kind of, the empathy and the kind of, it was cathartic for me. And I, I could even open up because 
the way they encompassed my, me and the empathy that I got from them. And these were all Catholic people, you know, who I always kind of felt alienated from because I suffered at their hands. And I, so I wasn't very sure about how to. So this gave me a kind of a, a, a belief that I could open up. And this is how it started. That's when I started talking. So my first trip was 2005. And then I went again with, with the students from the Saint Catholic uh, University, Saint Elizabeth, a women's college. And this is what happened. This is how I started. And I've posted a couple of links while you were speaking there, Pincus. The second one uh, takes people to the 60 Minutes clip if they want to watch it in full. The other one I just posted is from the, the documentary you did with uh, Hebrew University in Tel Aviv, which is very compelling. And Todd, if we have another minute, there's a, a little clip from that one that I'd like to play. And I think it's uh, just a really, really powerful conclusion. Just let me get the correct screen set up there. Now, Pincus didn't, didn't mention, but at his synagogue, he's the cantor. And on one of his visits to, to Warsaw, he had the opportunity to go into the into the new synagogue and sing Kaddish and it's it's one of the most compelling things you can ever imagine <laughs> I can only imagine, you know, what a cathartic moment that must have been for you individually. I think that watching that video certainly made me feel that way. And I think it must have made all of us feel that way. Yeah, you can't imagine what it means to a person where, where you know, where he belongs to a culture and a spiritual uh, kind of, uh, who is a full, uh, uh, to a family who was spiritually very much involved in, 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 their, in their religiosity and their culture going back thousands of years. And uh, to be able to, I mean, the first time is when I went with the Catholic educators and I went to Krakow. No, it was the first time I, when I went to uh, Krakow with, uh, with Stephen Smith, the, you know, with Stephen Smith, you know who that is. Uh, and I went to Krakow in 2002. And uh, we, I had my whole family, and we went to the little Remu synagogue in Krakow that the Germans did not destroy. And it was beautiful. It was like a like, like a chocolate, you know, bonbonier. And uh, we went inside. It was very small, a very small synagogue. And I got up onto the bima, and I suddenly started singing. It just came out of me because. You know, and, and, and what did I sing? What prayer did I sing? I, I prayed this air. It's difficult to, I, I don't know how to translate it, but bring, you know, we come back to you. And this is when they put the Torah back into the ark. You know, this is the prayer that when you put the Torah back in the ark and, and you thank God for, for, for being there, this is what I sang. And tears were flowing from my eyes. This is the first time. And then when we did the, the this, uh, I went back to the synagogue in, in Warsaw and the same thing happened. You know, I got up on the beam and I couldn't stop singing. So they, photog they, video they photographed it and put it into the, um, into the documentary. Mm -hmm. But you know what I don't have, which you can send me, 
is the link to the 60 minutes. I don't, I, I didn't even know <laughs> that I could get it. So uh, I didn't bother. But if you have it send, it, send it to me. I would like to have it. I promise I'll do that right away. No, that's um, okay. Yeah, and Todd, um, I haven't totally been keeping my eye on the chat. Have there been any questions that anybody wanted to ask Pincus? You know, there's been chat back and forth. Um, I don't know if Connor has a question for you, Pincus, or if you have something else to say. If it's something not for Pincus, Connor, we could defer to Monday night, if you, if you don't mind. Uh, but if you have a question for Pincus, please do feel free to ask him. Um, Pincus, thank you so much. We all feel so privileged to have spent this time with you. And I know that tomorrow is a very busy day. You're gonna be going through your story several times, you know, on network radio and television. And um, I, I just, I'm grateful that you were able to give us this evening to hear your story um, and would love to spend time with you again, whenever you'd like. Well, I am available. I, you remember I told you at the beginning before we started that I, this is my duty, I do that because I want to, actually want the world to become a better place. I want to tell, as I said before, uh, I just finish off by telling you, when I finish off with students and others, I give them a gift. And the gift is a torch. The torch, like an Olympic torch. The Olympic torch has only got one flame. And the flame of the torch shows, you know, kind of, that the camaraderie amongst the uh, uh, partic participants in, in, in the games should be nice and everything. But my torch has got more than one, and I hand it over to them. And my torch has got many flames. Amongst those flames, the ones I, I mentioned, no religious discrimination, no racial discrimination, no homophobia, no xenophobia, no hate. Per, hate is pernicious. So I give you this, spread that flame, take it, you know my story, you know, I'm giving you this flame, spread it, and let the light, light up the world with this, and make the world a better place. Like, we, you, you know a little bit of the story, you know what happened, you know what, what is happening today, you know what shouldn't happen, and make the world a better place, that these things don't happen again. Bob Book, I didn't see that you had your hand raised. Uh, thank you very much, Mary, for letting me know. Bob? Um, sir, first of all, I, I sent you a message, but you, you are a mentor of the highest order, sir. And I'm forever grateful to be able to listen to your story. But I do have a question. I, I recently read a book called Lightning Down. And this is about a, an American uh, flyer that was shot down in France. And he was sent to Buchenwald. When you were there, were you aware that there were um, a couple hundred allied flyers uh, in camp there for a while? We were aware that some, uh, that some of the Americans were there and also that some of them actually lost their life in Buchenwald. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, we were aware of that. When I was in Buchenwald, we were aware of that. And as a matter of fact, when they called us to the, to the you know, when, when they call you to the gate, there was a gate. And when they call you to the gate, we saw they were going to come and shoot you. So that when they call our names out, we knew, didn't know what was going to happen. We saw they were going to kill us. But, but in the meantime, Hassar came to collect us to work in the as slave labor in Colbitz. But we were very, very worried because we knew that when the Americans were being called to the gate, it meant that they were going to kill them. So we and knew that. Was, that. And the funny thing about the Nazis were, in all occurrences, they did they always kept on moving everybody west because they did not want to be captured by the Russians. They 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 did not want that to happen because the Russians had real short memories of what the Nazis did to them. And um, so I just wanted to throw that in. But I, I can't thank you enough, sir. God bless you and keep you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Okay, if we don't have any other questions for Pincus, we'll let him go. Thank you so much, Pincus, once again for joining us. Scott Masters, you are such an expert interviewer, so knowledgeable. Um, I, I thank you also. I'm, I'm very grateful. This is a very special evening, and we're going to share it as broadly as possible. Uh, I hope you all join us on Monday night when we have our VBC happy hour. We'll be commemorating the Tet Offensive, the 54th anniversary of the Tet Offensive in Vietnam with uh, Vietnam veterans. So thank you all. Take care.
Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.